why is Rashi the commentary that's the sort of the first stop for everybody and inside of all the Chumashim and you know there are a lot of great commentaries out there you know Rashi was the only rabbi who even if you want to say because he lived in a certain period or Maimonides lived during that period and Nachmanides, the Ramban, Rashi's grandson, the Rashbam, the Ibn Ezra. You know, why is Rashi the go-to commentary that that's the first stop in every Chumash? Uh, okay, so what does Rashi do, essentially? So one thing, obviously, about Rashi is very special is Rashi is a, a tremendous gift for brevity. We see that in the Gemara as well. Um, the fascinating thing about Rashi is that the last thing Rashi actually focuses on during his lifetime is public is the getting public public publishing his commentary on Chumash. I mean, Rashi had done quite a lot up until then, and he saves uh, his commentary on Chumash to the end of his life. Rashi's already after the age of 70 by the time he publishes his commentary on Chumash. Why? Because we see that Rashi's using a tremendous wide range of Midrashic and Talmudic sources. So for Rashi, it's not just about giving an answer that works in the text. And that's a large conversation about Rashi in and of itself. Right, uh, Rashi himself in, in Sefer Bereshis tells us early on that he's giving us shot. He's not out to give us drushos, meaning we have right four levels of interpretation. There's the pshat, which is the simple meaning, and there's the drusha, which is the exegetical interpretation. So now that I said that, I'm sure you have no questions what that means because it's exegesis. So we just have blind faith. Uh, so exegetical interpretation means that we can, we're using a little bit more poetic license and trying to understand maybe deeper concepts. And then we go also on to Remez and Yesod when things get deeper and more esoteric and seemingly uh, further from the straightforward understanding of the verse. Okay, so Rashi says, I'm here to explain the Chumash to you in a straightforward manner. Well, of course, as we all know, straightforward doesn't necessarily mean simple. Uh, a, a phrase that I've heard, which I like, is that whenever you learn Rashi, just keep in mind that Rashi is as, just as smart as you are. So when you learn Rashi and you're seven, you know, oh, you know, I understand what Rashi's saying. Rashi and I were just, just as smart as me. And when you get to the age of 20, you realize the same thing. When you get to the age of 50 and the age of 70, in each stage as you keep growing in Torah learning, you realize that Rashi is just as smart as you. Because despite Rashi being so deceptively simple, straightforward, there are actually rather a lot, a lot of complexity that Rashi holds into short phrases. The other big benefit of, of Rashi is that Rashi sticks to rabbinic sources. Meaning, Rashi will always be quoting a Medrash or, or a Talmud unless Rashi tells you otherwise, right? If there's a word, which is maybe a little bit not so straightforward, you have to get creative, Rashi will tell you where it's coming from. If he's coming from the Unkelis, he's bringing you sources in other places in Tanakh. Or if it comes from one of the two great uh, dictionaryizers, What's that? How do you call a dictionary, Iser? Gram um, Gram grammarians. grammarians. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether if that's Menachem ibn Shaprut or um, Dunash ibn Labrat, right? Rashi will tell you where it's coming from. Uh, or there are a handful of occasions, but not very many, where Rashi says to you, the Oimer Libi, you know, this is my pshat. I don't have a source for mm -hmm. it in Chazal. But it's because of Rashi's reliance on Chazal and rabbinic texts that Rashi sort of gets priority over other Mephorshim that give you a straightforward interpretation, but not necessarily relying on Chazal. 
where it becomes very interesting in Rashi, where some of that complexity comes from that we spoke about, is that there's a seed of Midrashic material available to Rashi and Talmud. And so Rashi has to be incredibly selective of which sources he wants to use where, but not only that, also how he uses them. Rashi can sometimes use them a little bit creatively. He'll uh, pick only certain parts of the Midrash to, dis to discuss. Uh, or sometimes Rashi will even change a word or two in the Medrash, which will reveal a whole different approach to what the Medrash is trying to say. So Rashi's relying on... Does he tell you he's doing that? No. No. You have to know the Medrash. Well, you can go look it up. <laughs> yeah. But yes, yeah, so, right. Rashi's not telling you I'm changing something in the Medrash. For example, a uh, famous Medrash of... Um, with Noach, uh, that brings the Machlokas and the Talmud, whether or not Tzadik Hayab B'dor Tav, like Tamim Hayab B'dor Tav, whether that's a praise or whether that's not, right? So there, Rashi doesn't tell you, he says, B'dor Shal Avraham, whereas the Gemara says, B'dor Shal Tzadikim, Rashi says, B'dor Shal Avraham. And if you mm -hmm. follow Rashi's line of reasoning there, you get it to amazing depth in Chazal, in the words of our sages, uh, and Rashi either understood that that's really what they intended when they said that, or he's using you it as a platform to take you in a different direction, which is also Chazal-based, but not you wouldn't necessarily get there directly from that. that yeah, it's much more dramatic to say the generation of Abraham than the sages. Well, yeah, but there's also good reason for saying that Rashi actually sources... I know, they were alive at the same time. So Rashi did live in that generation. Rashi brings other sources afterwards to show you places where Chazal compared the two of them, which is not in the, in the Talmud over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is Rashi. Now, one of the challenges that, uh, you know, Jim, Jim joins us in the morning over there, we discuss it sometimes, is that if Rashi's helping us understand the pshat, the simple understanding in the text. So, for example, one text that we saw together was that Yaakov goes to sleep, right, in the place of the Harabais, and it says that he surrounded himself with stones. It says he woke up in the morning and he lifted up one stone. So Rashi's dealing with a problem in the text, right? When he lay down, there were stones, plural. When he woke up, there's only one. What happened to the rest of the stones? Okay, so actually let me stop there and just bring up that important point. The consensus is that just like the Mishnah is only talking when it needs to talk, the Talmud is only talking when it needs to talk, Rashi's only talking when he needs to talk. Rashi's not an interpretation, right? He's not, uh, um, I'm sorry, he's not a translation. He's not an art scroll translation. That's not what he's here for. Rashi is here to help you when you've run into a contextual issue. There's something wrong with the text. Either context or grammar, right? Unfamiliar words, contradictions. That's where Rashi steps up and says, I have, you know, I'm, I'm going to help you out because you can't make it past here without this help. So we'll see, though, sometimes that as we saw over there, that Rashi says, okay, here's the problem. The problem is that the verse started, there were several stones, and by, by the end, the same idea, there was only one stone. What happened to the other stone? So Rashi brings, and according to Rashi, this would be Pshat, seemingly. Well, that itself is a disagreement, whether or not Rashi sticks strictly to Pshat, that the stones were fighting with each other. Because everybody wanted to be under the head of the Tzaddik. And so Hashem performed a miracle and made all the stones into one stone. There are like so many questions to ask. Well, like the basic one. Since when do rocks fight with each other? <laughs> right? Do rocks have seichel? Right? Yeah, the last have... time we heard about that was Avraham's father. Rocks have itzle? <laughs> yeah, right. That was a good ruse. Uh, and there it didn't even happen, right? Yeah. So that's it. So what does it mean that, that rocks fight with each other? So even though Rashi will bring us the words of our sages sometimes, Sometimes the words of our sages themselves can have certain challenges. So, for the most part, and you see that that every 
everyone was dealing with a with a generation, the generational challenges that their generation brought up and styles of interpretations as well. And so later <coughs> interp- uh, commentaries on the Torah <coughs> were very concerned with dealing with showing you the depth of what Chazal, our sages, were actually saying. Meaning, don't look at this as a, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a cartoon, right? Rocks getting up and fighting, right? Uh, letters coming to Hashem and complaining, uh, astral bodies getting jealous of each other. It all sounds very silly and superstitious. It's, a, you know, this is like Greek mythology stuff, right? So you had certain later commentaries, like the Malbim, uh, like uh, Rabbi Yeshua Heller, like the Maral happens to be early. There were two commentaries I think that stand out, there are probably more, but two that, that I know, the Maisa Hashem, uh, Rabbi Eliezer, Ashkenazi, Ben Arofa, and the Maharal, right? The Maharal of Prague, uh, that were very concerned that people don't look at Chazal as being this sort of like superstitious, silly uh, approach, because you didn't re- then you didn't really answer the question, right? The whole point was to answer a question over here. So there are several what they call super commentaries on Rashi. Uh, probably the two most famous are the Mizrahi and the Gurari. Uh, I won't name a superior commentary because that itself is also subject to much debate, but don't be surprised if you see the Maharal beating up on the Mizrahi every once in a while. Because, you know, when you care about someone, you beat up on them. That's how it goes. He cares about Rashi, he cares about the Mizrahi, so he beats up on them. Uh, but the, the Mizrahi and the Gurari, two very famous ones, but they have a lot. Um, there's the Divrei David from the Taz. Uh, they have someone, they put out a very nice I, do they still print it? I don't know how easy it is to find it. There's a Mikrod Gedolot, just like you have a Mikrod Gedolot with all the different commentaries. They have one just for the super commentaries on Rashi. Okay, you also have the Sisei Chachamim at the bottom of every Chumash, who quotes a lot of the super commentaries. Sisei Chachamim is itself a very interesting history. Um, not always reliable, mostly reliable, but unlike the other super commentaries on Rashi, the Sifat Chacham was not a great rabbi of the generation. He was a Fader teacher who also happened to own a printing press. <laughs> and so his popular commentary that he put together for his students on Rashi, helping them understand some questions, answering certain questions they had on Rashi, uh, and, and giving them access to some of the super commentaries, he started printing together with his Kumashim, and it became popular. I mean, he certainly did a fine enough job that it became a traditional addition to all of our Kumashim nowadays. Okay, so the idea is that you can take Rashi at face value, or you can go deeper. And you can ask questions and start trying to open Rashi up. So there's a famous, there's a few famous, one famous classic approach is the Sefer Zikaron. That's the approach that um, uh, I don't know if it's Dr. No, he doesn't call himself, or Dr. Bonchek uh, uses. He put out these really great sperm called What's Bothering Rashi. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a three-stage approach in understanding Rashi. My Rebbe used more of an amalgam between that and the famous Derech uh, Talmud of Yitzchak Ampinton who was really one of the great educators, uh, pe- pedagogues of the Jewish people. Uh, we don't have access to that much of his uh, sparum, but he was the Rebbe for really some of the most famous rabbis in Jewish history at a very turbulent time. Uh, Moshe de Leon was one of his uh, students. Also the, uh, the, father, <laughs> the father of the Be- Ben Yosef was also one of his students. Um, so, so basically, the, the approach is, is actually a, a four-step approach to Rashi, and I think it's it's uh, very user-friendly and, and and really makes learning Rashi much more 
enjoyable and, and you can break it down into simple steps. So four step approach to learning Rashi. Step one, you ask the question, what's bothering Rashi? If, like we said, as our premise, Rashi only speaks when there's something that he needs to speak about, right? Some textual issue that's bothering Rashi. Then if Rashi's speaking, that means there's something in the text which is bothering Rashi, there's something in the text which isn't working, right? Like our example is how did several rocks become one rock? That's a textual issue. So the first thing we have to know is what is bothering Rashi? Why does Rashi feel so strongly like he needs to speak right now? The second step is, well, how did Rashi answer the question? Right? What was Rashi's answer to the question? So in our case, Rashi's answer to the question, in the case that we brought up, was that Rashi solved it with this medrash, that the rocks were fighting, and Hashem turned them all into one rock. Step three, what questions do we have on Rashi? Do rocks fight? Should you ever see a rock fight with another rock? Okay, step four, in answering our questions, what musr, what valuable insights for life, are we taking away with our resolution from Rashi? Okay, so that's the background to what I want to try to do. We're going to see a Gur Arye. Uh, it's, um, I chose this Gur Arye because it's one of the most remarkable, eye-opening, a lot of Gur Arye's are not all uniform. Uh, some of them are incredibly technical. The Maharal is at times dealing with very technical issues in Rashi, why Rashi had to say certain things. But every once in a while, there'll be a Guraye where you sort of feel the Maharal leaning forward and saying, come on, I'll tell you something. And uh, those, some of those Guraye's, they're just life-changing. So this is one of them, that if you uh, sort of are able to connect to this idea in the Maharal, um, it changes your way of viewing the world. Now, the Maharal is going to be a central important figure. We're probably going to talk about him a lot. Uh, other than the fact that, that, that as we see that the Maharal is a champion of Rashi because the Maharal, as we said, is deeply concerned that people understand what our sages are doing when they give these sort of metaphorical interpretations, uh, how to understand them on, the, on the, what's the deeper message Chazal are trying to, to give over to us. The other thing is, it's something that's come up lately over here, since people have questions and, and we've been discussing some works that deal a little bit in Kabbalah, is that the Maharal is uh, generally, not the Maharal necessarily on Rashi, but the Maharal's works generally are deeply Kabbalah based. However, the Maharal wrote his Svarim before the Arizal was really a known commodity. They did overlap, but the Maharal was already the Zakein Hador. He was already in the older generation. The Arizal was much younger. And the Maharal had basically developed an entire way of discussing Kabbalah, which sounds very much not like Kabbalah. It sounds very philosophical. And he uses a lot of terms which just don't sound like Kabbalistic terms. Which sometimes is good, because sometimes the jargon that comes along with Kabbalah can be a little bit confusing and overwhelming. We start talking about worlds and spheres and, and souls, and right? So the Maral doesn't have any of that jargon. But we'll see the way sort of the Maral talks about some of these ideas with this one right here. Okay, so I'll just give the background to the verse before I hand it out. We'll see Rashi, and we'll ask our four questions, and then hopefully we'll have time to see the Maharal's resolution. There's Chumashim here, if anybody wants to grab a Chumash. So you can just, just to see everything inside the text, you know, before before we start doing handouts. Uh, so we're in the book of Exodus, Shmot, Shmos. Uh, we're in, in ch um, chapter 2, and we're in verse 13, basically. So, Moshe has come to a, a, a venture out of the house of Paro, seemingly for the first time. For certainly the first time that's meaningful enough that the Chumash is going to discuss it. It says that Moshe went out on the first day. He, you know, goes to participate and, and see what's up with these Jewish people, what are they up to. On the second day he goes out, he sees a Egyptian... Um, beating uh, a Jew. He looks here and there. 
and sees there's nobody around, and he kills the Egyptian. Okay. The second day, he goes out the second day, and there are two Hebrews who are arguing. And he says to the wicked one, why would you strike your fellow man? And he says, meaning one of the two who are fighting, quarreling, who placed you as a uh, officer and a judge over us? Are you going to kill us the way you killed the Egyptian? And Moshe was fearful, and he said, uh, and hence the matter is no. Okay, so Rash is going to have some textual issues over here, uh, a lot of them. But before that, let's just talk about the story. What happens? Moshe goes out of the palace. He he sees an injustice. He wants to correct the injustice. He strikes down this Egyptian, and he buries him in the sand. The next day he goes out, he sees two Jews fighting. Going on? Why are you guys fighting? And all of a sudden they say, "Who are you? And who are you?" It's the evil one says that. Well, it doesn't say which of the two, okay. right? The one is described as evil. One is described as evil. Actually, Rashi teaches us a halacha from here that anybody who it says here, "Lama liomer l'rasha lama take re'echa." Take means it's, he hasn't yet done it. Why would you strike your fellow man? He hasn't even struck him yet. And from here we learn a halacha that if someone even goes to strike their friend, even if they haven't actually hit them, you know, like kids, like to, um, kids. Some of the unsavory parts of the world, you know, people do this thing to scare their friends. Uh, and that's called being a Russia. It's called you're, you're wicked, right? Because there's no positive benefit from that behavior other than to intimidate people or upset them. Yeah, so we don't know who makes the comment to Moshe, but one of them responds to Moshe, and who, who do you think you are? You came here to rule, to lord over us, to be a judge, to, to, to tell us how we should behave. What, are you going to kill us the way you killed the Egyptian? Whoops. And Moshe said, whoops. He becomes scared. He says, apparently the matter is known. And this is where Moshe begins his departure from Egypt. He flees after that. Where we see that really uh, Paro finds out about the whole thing and he tries to kill Moshe and Moshe uh, escapes Egypt. Okay. Let's take a, a moment to focus. So much for the idea that nobody ever escaped Egypt. Yeah, Moshe. <laughs> he knew how. Yeah. But he's not a slave. He was not a slave. Yeah. He was royalty. Just the and day he said before. no slave ever escaped, right? He was royalty the day before. Yeah. Um, the Medrash says that that was the day that he was placed over Paro's household. He became basically the overseer of everything Egypt on that day. Okay, so so we just we have to just try to understand what's happening with these two Jews. What what are they doing? Let's just us for us to understand the text. Moshe does a big favor to this guy. Rashi says it's the same guy, by the way. The same guy who was being beaten by a slave, uh, by an Egyptian yesterday. That's how he knows that Moshe killed the Egyptian. So Moshe comes out. He saves him the day before. And the next day, well, you're getting involved in my business? Who do you think you are? Well, you're a judge suddenly over the Jewish people? What's, what's going on with these guys? Those two, uh, two men, were they Jews? Yeah, two Jews, Ivrim. Mm. Were they it's... part of the laboring class or the foreman class? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I got a question about what comes next. But, uh... Seemingly they were part of the laboring class. Yeah. 
even though from a later Rashi it says that they were wealthy and then they lost their wealth, but, but seemingly they were slaves. They were not from the tribe of Levi, who was Levi seems to be the only people who are exempt from slavery at this point. So what's the question? What? We're working out what the question is. The group, they, they were group foremen. That's what the English translation is. The term is foreman. Uh, foreman is a taskmaster. Can be can be usually a, a group leader. You know, he's leading a group of 30, 40, 50 men. Maybe, maybe other. Which, which word? Ish sar? When they say that you, who made you? Uh, where's the translation that you're referring to? After, afterwards, he's talking about the uh, uh, subsequent to this, as, as the story goes on. Not here. But At the end of the part, yes. when they're talking about yes. the shotrim, the officers. Yes. Yeah. The uh, the uh, the officers and the way the, the way I read it, that these were Jews. And I saw this is a uh, uh, very early tables, you know. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. That's a, that's what I uh, absolutely. And uh, the capos were pretty bad people. I, I don't know about bad, but they uh, would do anything to try and survive at the expense of anybody. Okay. And um, I'm wondering if these two characters were okay. So first of all, I don't know. Second of all, Rashi does not learn it that way. I mean, Rashi is quoting our sages, and it seems to be implied in the verse that they took blows on behalf of the Jewish people mm -hmm. for them not reaching their quotas. They took the responsibility and said, you should hit us, it's our fault. And the merit of that, they went on to become leaders amongst the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But we, we don't know. But, but, but these two Jews, yeah... It seems to me that Moshe, a Rav once described Moshe to me as in the eyes of these two Jews being a Hollywood Jew. He comes out from his beautiful home, he looks at the people working, that's too bad, you know, straightens things out, then goes back to his, the palace yeah, again, right? sure. But the question, who made you this Tsar, right? Yeah. It seems they know the answer that he was made a Tsar. And it happened yesterday. Yeah. In fact, he was promoted. Yeah. Right? And he's vulnerable because he's not an Egyptian, and they seem to know it. Because, frankly, if he was really a prince of Egypt, a yeah. Theban prince of Egypt, instead of a Semite, adopted prince of Egypt, yeah. right? no Jewish slave is going to talk like that. I don't know. You're only talking like that because that guy is vulnerable... You know, and I, the proof I, that he's I, vulnerable is that he takes off immediately. I, I would love to tell you that I agree with you uh, in that assessment, but um, Jews are capable of a lot of really fascinating things. It's actually part of our conversation, what we're going to talk about with this when we see this Maharal, is that you see that Jews are tend to be truth speakers. And sometimes it comes out in very disturbing ways. I once heard a lecture from a certain Rav. Doesn't matter who it is. I mean, it does to me. Uh, and he brought up an interesting point. Actually, he said, "Oh, okay, good." He actually said on this pasuk. That's right. He actually quoted his Rebbe. Uh, if I remember correctly, he quoted uh, Rebbe Lopian that Moshe says a cheno that that the matter is known. What was the matter? He said the matter was that Jews always have to be under some sort of servitude. Because if they're ever unshackled, they'll destroy the world. This is Ravelli Alopian's um, interpretation over here. That if the Jews don't have the shackles of Torah, they need the shackles of Egypt. That was the exact lesson Moshe learned in this very moment. And this rough brought examples. He said, if you want to go back the last hundred years, a little bit more than hundred, more than hundred years now, he says, the three most destructive forces in the world were all Jewish. Marx, Freud. Marx, Freud, and Einstein. Right? Einstein, while well, working with another Jew, two Jews, gave us the technology for the atomic bomb. So, Oppenheimer. How does that happen? 
how is it that, that the Jewish people are, uh, that we're the opposite? He said, no, because our, our thirst for truth is so powerful that if it's unbridled, if it doesn't have direction, it can reach very destructive places. So that's what Rabbi Elopion said, that either it's Torah or it's Shibud Mitzrayim. And that's what Moshe understood in this moment in time. But if, if Moshe is a true prince of Egypt, in the yeah, sense I feel that, like you're working with a theory and you're trying to fit it into no, what we're talking about. Not, I don't know what you're saying is true. As a matter of fact, there's several commentaries who actually make that assumption. Why can't he sit... There are several comments that make the assumption why should Moshe be scared? He, he asked the question, why should yeah. he be scared? Yeah. Why should he be scared? Because he has a brisk, that's why. I saw yesterday <laughs> in, the, in the Ramad Valley, the Ramad Valley says there's no reason why Moshe should be scared. He grew up in the house of Paro. It's a question. He's obviously vulnerable. He was a chamberlain in the house. He's obviously vulnerable because <laughs> he's a Jew. I'll tell you this he's a much. Semite. I'll tell you this much. If I was a rational individual, Meaning, if I functioned by secular rationale, <coughs> yeah, if it wasn't a Meshuggah and a Jew, if I was like everybody else in the world, and, and someone who was the second most powerful person in the most powerful empire in the world came into conflict with me, I would shut up. Whether they were vulnerable or not vulnerable, why would you play that card? Unless you're a Meshuggah and a Jew. If you're Meshuggah and Jew, you care about truth so much, you can't hold yourself back. But what I'm saying is that they, they're they acting, the guys who are fighting, yeah. the way they speak to Moshe is like he's vulnerable. And Moshe's behavior is like they're right. He is vulnerable. Because what does he do? He doesn't, he doesn't say, turn around to his people and say, kill those two. Well, why would he? Because he's a prince of Egypt and they're slaves well, that are lying. Why would from, he kill them? Because he wants to prevent them from lying. Oh, well, okay. Well, right? We have to understand one thing. They're not lying. But Moshe, first of all, Moshe Rabbeinu, whether he's a prince of Egypt or not a prince of Egypt, is still Moshe Rabbeinu. In the end of the day, his whole essence is being a Moshe. A Moshe is, I mean, a Maya Mishisiu. I extracted him from the water. Right, the Medrash says it, a lot of commentaries explain it, that Moshe means that he's, his vision in life is to pull others out of the water. That's what Bayou did for him, that's what he does for others. Every place you turn around, it's mm -hmm. Moshe puts himself at risk to save other people. So he's not going to kill anybody, because he's still Moshe. But it's a question, it's an open question, and it could be, we'll see. They think he may. That's part of... They ask the question. Prashat. They say, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Right? Okay, I, first of all, there's problems with the Prashat that you're saying. Meaning, there's a reason why Rashi is going to speak over here. Right? And what, and this is part of the problem. Why would they be scared that Moshe is going to kill them? Because he killed a man the day before. Why did he kill a man before? He had two, there were two men there. He killed one of them. Which one? He killed the Egyptian. He killed his own, his own people. people. Why? I'm not sure they know the answer. We don't know that they know the answer to it. They don't know that he was we just know that we beating know, this guy. We, we, know the, we know the answer but to it. Record, they don't realize he was beating this guy within an inch of his life and he chose to kill this person to save the other person? It appears that he did it to remedy an injustice. So why would they be concerned that he's going to kill them? Because he's a killer. Oh. Okay, good. We're going to stop right there. This is going to be our headline as we go into our exploration of Rashi. Okay? The, the, the two fellows in the fight, according to Rashi, are Dasim and Aviram. So we have our headline. Dasim and Aviram, colon, right? They're, they're about to speak. Moshe is a killer. Fact. It's a fact, right? Killed someone. If you kill someone, you're a killer. Good? Good. We'll pause there. Good. I'm going to hand out source sheets. And we'll look at the Rashi's. Did I have a question?
Yeah. Can I have one too? Pharaoh right. oh. want to kill Moshe for killing Egypt? Good, that's a good question. He was legitimate. just made second in command it's, of Egypt. It's a legitimate question. The, the Ramad Valley actually builds up with the first Rashi to answer the question. Okay? Meaning, not only should it have been forgivable that Moshe killed an Egyptian, if Moshe would have told Paro the whole story of what this Egyptian was doing, then seemingly like he did the right thing. It's not the role of the Egyptians to follow people into their homes and have relations with their wives and harass them in the fields. And certainly that was something unusual. That was not what they were meant to be doing. So clearly this taskmaster was out of line. Okay. We're going to start with the Rashi. So, why, so I, I, why do we think it's the same guy <coughs> on day one and day two? Oh, why does, how does Rashi know that they're the same uh, uh, person day one and day two? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question, but it's also going to be irrelevant, so I'm going to push on it in favor of getting through material. Okay. But we can look at it together. Uh, I'm just... Okay. <coughs> See uh, um, Rashi. <laughs> okay. So, oh, it's a little bit tiny, but it's fine. We have the two verses we just read over there in Shmot, Yudgimot, Yudal. First Rashi. It's, I didn't even bother trying to translate it in English because the translation is nearly impossible. <clears throat> they said, Who made you a man of prince to judge over us? Now, in English over here, straight from Chabad.org, they do an admirable job. They wrote, do you plan to slay me? Halargeni ata Omer. As we know, Omer is not the standard word we use when we want to talk about a plan. It's just not the standard word. So as you can imagine, that's a problem for Rashi. Halargeni ata Omer. Omer doesn't mean to plan. So, the, you see that the, the wonderful rabbis in Chabad try to help you out a little bit over here. And they say, literally, do you say to slay me? And that's how you would literally have to read the verse. That's not in Rashi, that's them giving everybody a helping hand. It's a literal translation. The literal translation, halargenia ta omer, would be, do you say to slay me? Which... Literally, it's a, that's the reason why we translated it not literally as plan, because you say to slay me doesn't mean anything. Says Rashi, Mikan Anulamdim, Shahargo Meshemu Mefarash. From here we learn that Moshe killed the Egyptian with speech, by saying one of Hashem's holy names. Okay, so David, that's one possible, David, one possible answer to your question that the Ramad Valley gives, that Moshe wasn't concerned he was going to find that he killed the Egyptian. He was concerned that part was going to find out that he used one of God's holy names in order to kill him. That would be really bad. Because that means that Moshe is using the forces of Kedusha. Sources of Tumor would be fine. If he used impure names, names of demons, that would be great. Totally in line with Paro's philosophy. If he's using God's sacred names, that's a big problem. Okay. First Rashi. Second Rashi. The Yar Moshe. And Moshe became frightened. Rashi says, Ke Shuto. That is a very bizarre, unusual thing for Rashi to say. Ke Pshuto, according to its simple meaning. Meaning, Moshe got scared. He got scared that Paro would find out so if it's Kipshuto, we don't really need Rashi to say anything. Right? Yeah. We don't need Rashi to tell us Kipshuto. We know Kipshuto. If Rashi's talking, that means that I, am, I don't know how to read this Kipshuto. And Rashi says, no, no, Kipshuto. You can read it Kipshuto. Which in itself is quite fascinating. That Rashi needs, feels the need to say Kipshuto. But then Rashi goes on. When we draw show the Aglo al Shirab be Yisrael Rashaim del Turim. Right? Moshe was <coughs> the, the Medrash, the exegetical interpretation 
was that Moshe was concerned that he saw within Israel Rishayim del Turim, wicked people who were gossips or tattletales. Amar ma'ata shema enam ra'uyim lehigael. Oh, could be the Jewish people are not fitting to be redeemed. Okay, step one. What's bothering Rashi in the verse? Why would he be afraid? Could be that question. Why should Moshe be afraid? Moshe really shouldn't be afraid. So Rashi says, no, there's room to say that he was afraid. He was afraid of Paro finding out, whatever, in whatever way, whatever concern that was. But then why does Rashi need a medrash? Meaning, if the simple shot works, you don't need a medrash. Rashi brings a medrash because the simple shot's not working. Why isn't it working? I'm asking you that question. I think it is working. Well, Rashi doesn't agree with you. And if I have to choose between two wonderful <laughs> rabbis, I'm going to choose Rashi, even though I love you dearly. <laughs> Rashi says, simple shot's not going to work over here. The Rashi feels pressed to bring a medrash. So how does Rashi answer the question? What is Moshe scared of? What's Rashi's answer to the question? He's afraid that the Jews are informers, that they're gossips. Why and, they, that? and they will never leave Egypt because of that. Oh. So Rashi's afraid, the Rashi says Moshe's afraid the Jewish people can't get out. Which, by the way, you could also go back to inform us on our first question, right? Meaning, if Moshe has this whole, he understands this whole history of what's happening with the Jews and that they're meant to go out and even has passwords of Picardity because... But he, he doesn't know that then. He doesn't? Why do we think Moshe knows it then? He's he doesn't growing know up in the He's going to be the redeemer, but he was raised in his mother's house until he was a young man. It says it in the verse. I thought it was till he was weaned. Does not say that in the verse. So we assume Moshe has some understanding of, of what's going on. And the Jewish people are going to be redeemed. And therefore he should have zero reason to be afraid of Paro. Why not be afraid of Paro? We're the Jewish people, he's an Egyptian. Advantage us. But now Moshe is afraid. Right? And this could help us because Medrash is not supposed to Ain medrash yote ain medrash yote de pshuto. That's supposed to leave the pasha understanding of the verse with the medrash. But if really Moshe is, the medrash is telling us Moshe is afraid of Paro, because the Jewish people have no right to be redeemed, which fits in with the fact that Moshe is afraid of Paro. Why is Moshe afraid of Paro? Because now he really feels powerless. If the Jewish people can't be redeemed. Then Hashem's not, I don't have Hashem in my, you know, watching my back. Questions? What questions do we have on Rashi? Go straight to our. I, I, think Rashi, I think Rashi is going to a great deal of effort to weave a very complicated cloth. He sure is. When the shot is, it, my, my understanding of the verse. That's right. And. I'm just going to add one more element to it. That's right. right. This is a Theban dictatorship. Pharaoh's right. In the midst of this Theban dictatorship, first Yosef, now Moshe, are, permit, are promoted over Egyptians to a very high rank. The rest of the court are Thebans. They're not Semites. Oh, They're not Jews. Hold on, just in the Pasha Pshat, yeah? What? Nobody knows that Moshe is a Semite. Maybe other than the daughter of Paro. Because Paro gave a clear order to kill all the Jewish babies. All the babies? That were born the same year as Moshe. Even the Egyptian. Even the, oh, this is, okay. Good question. Even seemingly later, even the Egyptian babies were killed. Is mm -hmm. that in the Strait? Is Rashi bringing that? I don't remember. Rashi brings it also the Egyptian babies were killed. So they're both existing, Joseph and Moshe, in a world 
it's a world of snakes in terms of plots and counterplots that go on. You know, we just know this from Egyptian history. Forget everything else for a second, right? Moshe is a vulnerable individual. You think that Pharaoh doesn't know he's a Jew? Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll go like this, just to try to save a lot of time and effort. You said something that was very correct. Rashi's working and going to extreme lengths not to say the Pashup Shah. Yeah. Because he could have left it, and he didn't. Okay? And if the, the, but the other thing is that if the Pashup Shah would work, then Rashi would use it. He would need to bring a Medrash. So that's something that we just have to go home with and say, okay. It could be a Rashi that you can sit on for years. It's okay. You're welcome to sit with Rashi for years. You know? Only good things will, will happen. If you spend time saying, Rashi doesn't agree with me, I need to interpret, reinterpret what I'm saying and understand why, why what I'm saying is wrong. And only good things will come out of doing that. So Rashi clearly doesn't accept the Pashup Shat. He brings him a Drashic interpretation that Moshe's true fear is the Jewish people... The tattletales, the gossips, and therefore they cannot be redeemed. Questions? Do we have questions on Rashi? We're taking questions on Rashi. Yes. Does that make any difference? I'm sure. What? But he asked Hashem that same question. Questions. Well, we're not getting ahead of ourselves. He asked Hashem the same question. Moshe asks Hashem. What merit do these people have to be redeemed? Okay, yeah, Moshe was wrong. He thought that they were they weren't able to be redeemed. He was wrong. They were, as we see, history moved forward and they were redeemed. But he's got that that in his head already before he saw tells something. Him, Go and, and free my people. Because he just saw something that showed him that they weren't weren't fitting to be redeemed. He saw something that contradicted the ability to have redemption. Meaning, this is a landmark point in Rashi right now. If, if you, if you Mo, go... If, one second. I'm sorry. Moshe just witnessed something where he said, Whoa! If that's the reality, no Google. No way. It can't happen. It's a question yeah. on Rashi? I think so. <laughs> I think so. I'm just trying to understand the logic of how it's falling together. So if we accept that Moshe ha understands Picard, Picardity and the whole history of everything, he also knows that the Jews are not due to be redeemed for another 200 years or 190 years, whatever. Right? 400 years. They're not due to be redeemed now. I don't even know why he's even thinking about redemption right now. So, that, so that's, that, you can't even, you can't ask that question. I just did. I know, <laughs> I know. But when it comes to the numbers, right, how many, how many times have uh, Gedalia Dor told us when Mashiach is going to come? The, the answer to that question goes a little bit like this. Someone once asked Rav Schwab uh, if he believes Mashiach could come at any time. Rav Schwab said, of course. And then he said, oh, what about uh, this day and that day? Chazal tells us Mashiach can't come on this day. Chazal tells us Mashiach can't come on this day. And Rav Shab said, you don't let Mashiach come. No, that and, doesn't work here. And if, Abraham was told oh, 400 well, years. <laughs> it's specific. You have to let me finish. Yeah? He says, we're going to let Mashiach come. When Mashiach comes, we're going to ask him, how can we come on a day when Chazal said you can't come? Okay, so even the 400 years, which you brought up, wasn't well, 400 years. We see that it was a different 400 years than we understood 400 years. Do you know how many people got the answer wrong to 70 years in Gullah's bubble? Kings, 90%, Jews. I would guess. No, it happened over and over yeah. and over. Belshazzar yeah. got it wrong. Everybody got it wrong. 70 years was a clear number. Nobody could figure out how to calculate it. Was it by this gullus? Did it start at that gullus? Are we supposed to count this? Are we not supposed to count that? Right? So you, you, you can't ask the question. And regardless, Moshe is saying even the, the basic ingredients, the, the aleph base of geula, 
It ain't here. Why if does, this is the Jewish people, it's not going to happen. Why does gossip? Why is gossip the thing that prevents you from? Thank being, you. You're asking a question on Rashi. I appreciate that. I was going to get to it. That's a great question on Rashi. <laughs> what kind of answer is that? Because people gossip, they can't be redeemed. Makasher, why? What's the connection? Supporting Rashi, we see that it's true. Why was the base of Mikdash destroyed? Why was the second base of Mikdash destroyed? See, not you know. And the Shon Hara, which the Chafetz Chaim connects the two ideas. I know if it's the same idea. Hating a fellow Jew, speak against him. But one it didn't idea. prevent it didn't prevent redemption from Egypt. Moshe was wrong. Moshe was wrong. Yes, Moshe was wrong. But we see that there is an aspect to Lashon Hara that prevents or or does not allow for Geula. Why do we not have a base of Mikdash today? It's not supposed to. If it takes, if it's such a hard question, you guys have not been paying attention to all the Tisha B'Av videos. <laughs> from the Chavitz or the Heritage Foundation. Or the news from yesterday. <laughs> or the news from yesterday. Why do we not have a base of English right now? Because we're still speaking Lashon Hara. So you see that there's some aspect of Sinas Chayim Lashon Hara, which, in fact, does not allow Gugula to occur. It holds it off. Now, the mechanics of that, we're not going to know until we see the Maharal. Seems like we're not going to see the Maharal until next week. Which is fine. Because Maharal sometimes gets, he can have his own stage. He's worth it. Oh, absolutely. Well, let's look at part two of Rashi. Part two of Rashi might be even more disturbing than part one. Okay, so if Moshe Rabbeinu is scared from, from Amishral, he's not going to get a duel. So why is he running away from what? He's not scared from Paul. Scared from scared of Mitzrayim. From Amisrael. For but then that thing. So he, if there's the a shaykhus for Amisrael to have gula, the Moshe having a shaykhus to Amisrael can be part of that gula. If Amisrael is not zoche to gula, then Moshe Rabbeinu is in trouble. If it's getting around that he's using Shemus Kedoshim, he's helping Jewish people. Uh, it's not good. What, why does God have to reassure him that Pharaoh is dead? We're just going to get. Who is he to make the decision in the first place? What do you mean? Well, Moshe, he made the decision that these people are not redeemable. Yeah. So who is he to make the decision? So, so, like this I'm not a doctor. But you play one on TV. You play one on TV. But if I find a body on the floor and there's no pulse and they're not breathing and they're ice cold, then I'm going to say this is not a living person. I'm not a doctor. But everything I know about what living people are like tells me that living people have a pulse, they breathe, and they have color in their face. So Moshe Rabbeinu sees a corpse. He says, I know what freedom looks like. I know what Gula looks like. This is a corpse. From everything I understand about Gula, they can't go free. And we have to understand then what Moshe misunderstood. But Moshe understands, if, if this is what, what's disturbing Moshe, it means he understands very deeply what the concept of Gula looks like. Okay, next Rashi. Indeed, the matter has become known. Again, another surprising Rashi. Rashi says, you could learn that literally. Just take it like a literal interpretation. Not necessarily the pshat. That's, pshat means within the context of the verse. Like the word, literally, when it sounds like the thing was known. You could understand it literally. Meaning that what? That, that it was known that he killed the Egyptians. Seemingly, that's that's what's happening. When Midrash Barash is going to bring us a Midrash, no Dali, who's Li Moshe, is known to me. That word wasn't in the verse. Chen no da no davar Li. Not what the verse said. 
שהייתי טמא עליו. Finally I understood this thing that I couldn't understand it for years, I was going crazy. This is what you have, you know. Ma chato Yisrael mikol shivim umos. What is the transgression of the Jewish people which is worse than the 70 nations of the world? Leyot. What's that word say? I can't read it. Nirdim. Mavodat parech. They're, um, they're being, uh, subjugated. Uh, to, to, uh, uh, back-breaking labor. Look around the world. They have slaves, also different nations. Yeah, so it was widespread throughout the ancient world. Why is this slavery of the Jewish people so much objectively worse than everybody else? Why are they being forced into this horrible back-breaking labor? As much as I finally understood it. Why they're worse than everybody. I shouldn't say worse. By the transgression is bigger than everybody else's transgression. Now, because I know that they're gossips, right? Because because they're del Turin, now I understand they deserve it. Two people, and he makes that generalization about the whole nation. Good question. That's not done with Kapskus. <laughs> well, apparently he's not supposed to be done with Kapskus over here. He's wrong, and he's generalizing his mistake. Yeah. So, so far we have a lot of votes against Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> it's a good question. The Maral himself deals with the question. that, that Meaning, it's a legitimate question. We only saw two people. How does he come to the conclusion that it's all the Jewish people? If he's not afraid of Paro. Yeah, and he's afraid that the Jews. The reason he's afraid is because the Jews are going to remain slaves. That's really the reason. Why does God have a need to reassure him that the man who wants to kill him has died before he goes back? Paro. Yeah. I mean, Why does he have to reassure Moshe? Moshe's not scared of Paro. Everybody's telling me this. Yeah. I'm saying he's afraid of Paro. So actually, that he's vulnerable. Inter- interestingly enough, Rashi learns that. Paro is for Yisro. Yisro is the one who's scared of Paro. Moshe is told before he returns to Egypt that, you, that the people who want to kill you are now dead. Good. Rashi says? I don't know. Dasim and Avira. What? Dasim and Avira. Are dead? The two men fighting. They're dead? He's not talking about Paro at that point? That. Rashi says that they're dead, and he says that they're not literally dead, but they've lost all their influence, their affluence and influence over the Jewish people. But what's they've become a- impoverished. What's actually happened is they're actually alive, and Paro is dead. That's, what not dead. That, that's says, the history of it that we learned from the Torah. The, and Rashi didn't say anything? Rashi doesn't say Paro's dead. Rashi says Paro's got Torah. No, I didn't say that he said Paro's dead. I said Paro is dead because... We learn that a new pharaoh arose over, who did not know Joseph, at the beginning, over Egypt, right? At the beginning of the book of Shemos, before Moshe was born. Before Moshe was born, we learn that. It's right at the beginning of the story. Before he's born, we learn that? Yes. Rashi understands that the, Moshe was, the people that Moshe were afraid of were these two Dalturi. These two gossips. When Moshe hears that they've lost any influence and affluence over the Jewish people, he's comforted and he feels he can go back. Look at Rashi. That explains the Rashi. Which Rashi obvious, the which, by the way, is obviously wrong because they remain influential. They didn't. Right. They didn't? What's the oh. story of Korach? Where is Das and Nevarim there? Well, no. First of all, the story of Korach, you're now talking almost 40 years removed. The same two guys. Same two guys. They still have influence. Not sure. Good question. Maybe. They certainly have a role in the Jewish people that this is what they constantly do. Now, Moshe had to get the Jewish people out of Egypt. He can't know what's going to happen in the desert, how Dust and Avira are going to change. I mean, the fact that, by the way, Dust and Avira make it out of Egypt 
is itself an unbelievable power. Right? 80% of the Jewish people don't make it out because they're not interested in Geula. That's if you're interested in Geula. Okay, there's a lot. We could have a separate Dasma Viram class because to me they're two, the most, they were arguing. they're two of the most fascinating characters. It's always the characters who almost don't exist that are always the most fascinating. I agree. We could have a conversation about Pichol someday also, whose, whose, whose name is, his mouth is everything and he never speaks once. If you see so, the story through their eyes, it's a very different story. It is a very different story. Hopefully actually the moral is going to help us understand the way they're seeing the world. Okay, so two things that Rashi lets us know. First of all, the real fear is that Jewish people don't deserve to be redeemed because they speak Lashon Har. More than that, Rashi says, the big chiddush that came from Moshe, Achen, oh, there, there, finally, finally, it's clear as day, I finally understand why Jewish people have to suffer so miserably more than anybody else in the world because they speak Lashon Har, they deserve it. And nobody else speaks Lashon Har but the Jews. You're asking a good question on Rashi. Everybody else also speaks Lashon Har. Right? It's not like the nations of the world don't speak Lashon Har. You know, if you ever pick up, what's that British tabloid, The Sun or whatever it is? Yeah? That's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a newspaper on how to speak Lashon Har. But here Rashi says, because Jews speak Lashon Har, that's why they deserve to be enslaved. And not just enslaved, backbreaking labor, more than anybody else in the world. Okay, good. I think we've set up our rashis really nicely. <laughs> so if you're salivating, it might be the smell of the pizza, or it might be the smell of the maral, which we'll have to broach next Sunday.